The thing that you have to do before you talk about what is happening now, I think it's probably useful to go back and you have to really start at the end of the great financial crisis. And the reason is there was a bunch of people coming out of the GFC who confused what the US government and some European governments were doing. At the time, there was the risk of a huge financial contagion. And so the US stepped in and the Federal Reserve started to use their balance sheet to buy toxic assets, right? And the ECB did that, and I think Japan did that as well. Anyways, a bunch of banks did it. I mean, a, bu a bunch of governments did it. And then there was this body of pseudoscientific economists who coined this thing called modern monetary theory, which basically said, hey, you can keep printing money and introducing it into the economy to smooth things out and to actually drive long-term growth. And it turns out that a bunch of government officials fell for it. And if you fast forward to 2022, so 14 years later, you know, governments around the world had printed something to the tune of about 30, 35 odd trillion dollars of money into the economy that should have never been there. So the thing to remember is like, we have not necessarily just been obfuscating true supply demand in the last six or eight months when we've been talking about a recession or inflation. We've been actually doing it since 2008. It's just that it's been building up in the system. So one of the things that we have to realize is that all of that money somehow needs to get destroyed in some way, shape or form if the true economic equilibrium is meant to be found. What is true supply? What is true demand in the absence of government sloshing money around trying to prop up things that should not be propped up or buying votes or all the grifts that these folks have engaged in in the last you know decade and a half have to get undone. So that's the backdrop. So if you think about taking $30 trillion out of the global economy, you know, you're talking about almost, you know, I think it's 85 trillion is the world GDP. So like, you know, it's, it's, it's almost half of an entire year's worth of global GDP. It's going to take three years, probably, of the slow, meticulous, you know, running off of money, you know, not reintroducing new money. So it seems like we're at the beginning of the beginning of something that's going to be long and drawn out. And that's separate from whether we're in a recession or not. That's just the bear market that we're in. Right. And so you have to look at asset prices today as a microcosm of a much larger trend that has to be about fake money pushing asset prices up. And now taking all that fake money out and finding out what the real price of something is. And I just don't think that takes six months. So for all the people that were, you know, hoping that this would be the end of it, Fed raises 75, we're done with this, they're going to raise 75 more. I just think that's not how it's probably going to be. It's going to take, you know, 24, 36 months. That may mean the bottom doesn't happen for another 18 months. So I think it's a, we're in, we're in for a lot of choppy, um, market action. I think you need to buckle your seatbelt because the next three, four, five months of CPI will probably be very, very bad. Seven, eight, nine percent. Why? There are a handful of components that have gotten completely run away. Number one, the biggest one is rent. And so rent works on a three month lag. We're going to reintroduce what the true owner's equivalent rent is into CPI. So we can already forecast that CPI going up. Oil is at 105 bucks a barrel. Russia is basically trying to break the back of Europe by now messing with their nat gas supplies. Um, the German energy minister yesterday said that if that happens, it could be a contagion equivalent to Lehman Brothers with respect to energy. When you play all of these things out, what you have is unfortunately rampant runaway costs that really have no mechanism to get back in check in the absence of some real governmental changes, our policy on this Ukraine-Russia war, you know, how we intend to sort of uh, work or cooperate or fight with China, all of these things have to get s solved. So in the absence of that, prices are going to continue to go up. And so what does the Fed do? How does it throw away what little credibility it has left when there's 8 and 9% inflation prints? and saying, we think we're done for right now. You can't do that. So they will overcorrect because there is just going to be so much pressure 
for them to act. All roads, I think, lead to lower equity prices. We've seen the first wave, but now it has to touch all these other areas. For example, we have gotten totally drunk on debt as a country. One of the most obvious places where we've been serving alcohol far too late into the night is in the financing of all these private equity leverage buyouts. Sketchy companies that are sort of like, you know, teetering on insolvency at times, where private equity comes in, levers up the balance sheet with debt, they price it right to the edge of what's legally allowed or what's financeable, and then they go do it. But that's all assuming the economy continues to grow. And so if all of a sudden you have some recessionary forces or prices go up and earnings don't, you'll have you know a contagion in the debt markets. You could have a contagion in the commodity market. I also want to tell you guys a quick story. One of the most interesting canaries in the coal mine of all of this was two days ago and what uh, happened to Facebook. And this sort of ties a lot of this stuff together in terms of like economics, inflation, asset prices, equities, tech. We should try to talk about non sort of, you know, big tech. But the everybody was saying, oh, gosh, the market's going to rip on the open. You know, we were closed for Juneteenth. And then on Tuesday, the market, you know, the S&P was up like 250 basis points, 2.5 percent. And the Nasdaq was also up, you know, call it maybe 300 basis points, r- roughly. But Facebook was down like 400 points, right? So it's a big spread. And why is that? And I was like, this makes no sense to me. What is going on with this price action? Everything was up. Apple was up. Google was up. And so I called around and, you know, I was like, why is this happening? And this is the best explanation I got. When you look at who the incremental buyer is in the stock market, it tends to give you a sense of whether prices can go up or will continue to go down. And the poorest informed buyer tends to be retail. And the most informed buyer tends to be these very large institutional hedge funds, right? So there's a spectrum. And uh, Facebook is an example of one of the of big tech that is poorly owned by retail. So it's mostly owned by smart money. And the case that smart money makes for owning Facebook is that it's got an extremely cheap price to earnings ratio. So you must own it. And what they said was that they, you know, looking at the tea leaves of consumer demand, what they actually re-underwrote was that actually it's not that the price to earnings was cheap, it's that the E in PE was just wrong. And if they pass through all of these increases in inflation and you know their earnings expectations into Facebook, it's actually more like fair value at a lower price. That's why they sold it so much on a day where the market was up. Now, why is that important? Well, eventually you're gonna touch all these other stocks as well that are gonna go through earnings revisions in this recession. This is where I think Wall Street has done a very poor job on behalf of retail. If you look at the average estimates of earnings, you will be shocked to hear that Wall Street actually has this year being record earnings, next year earnings continuing to go up. How do you see earnings continuing to go up into these prints like this when you cannot pass through, you know, 80, 90 percent increases in energy and cogs and whatnot? You'll, ha- you'll have to sell fewer things because there'll be fewer people with jobs to buy things. I think Wall yep. Street's wrong. And I think that earnings are going to go down this year and will definitely go down in 23. And so I think what probably happens is the entire world of equities needs to get repriced at a lower price. And in that, it's going to put enormous pressure on these cash-burning, non-profitable tech companies. We gave folks just a ton of money and what did they do? They acted rationally. They spent it. Yep. And now we have to take it all back. Um, and that's, that's, I don't think that's going to be as easy or as simple as people think. It's, it's stunning that, you know, the reason the stock market went up dollar for dollar was actually tied to the growth in the M2 money supply. The correlation was 0.92. So for every dollar the, that, that the Fed printed, the stock market went up by 92 cents. So, you know, it stands to reason that if the Fed is going to take three to five trillion dollars of value out, then we have to re-rate the equity markets by three to five trillion dollars at a minimum. And then you have to re-rate and re-baseline for earnings. And so that's probably another 20 or 30. Meanwhile, we keep losing our footing to China. Just today, CATL, which is one of the largest battery manufacturers, announced a pretty meaningful improvement in 
their you know 3.0 battery design these guys are now building batteries that can go a thousand kilometers um in both of the major you know um uh compositions that really matter nmc and lfp and and i just look at these things and i'm like wow we cannot actually get capacity funded to build domestic battery capability because we're too busy kind of basically virtue signaling on things that don't matter um and in return nothing happens china continues to lap us we uh it's really it's a really bad state of affairs we are uh we are in a very odd period in terms of government effectiveness